those of you who don't know me, I'm Kate Swanson. I'm the Public Engagement and Interpretation Educator at the Rockwell Museum. If you joined us for our last talk back in April with Amanda Monez, you heard me express my gratitude for the fact that we're still able to host these series to highlight the important work on focusing on women makers and creatives amidst this tumultuous time of dealing with so many new challenges. It was easy for a lot of the more focused works that cultural institutions were doing to kind of get lost in the shuffle. And I'm just really grateful that we're still able to do this and have an opportunity to continue hearing from women about women as we celebrate, of course, the centenary of women's right to vote this year. So, you know, just of course, that's the year that we all have to stay inside for three months and <laughs> cancel those things, but it's fine. <laughs> um, our talk this evening is going to serve as a bit of a kind of coming attractions. We plan to open the exhibition Kara Walker, Harper's Pictorial History of the Civil War, annotated two weeks ago at the Rockwell Museum. Um, but we will plan to have this exhibition on view when we eventually reopen later this summer. So this is going to, you know, be a, a kind of overview of things to come as well as um, talk about, about Kara Walker and her work. Um, our speaker this evening, of course, curated this exhibition at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And as a Smithsonian affiliate, we have the opportunity to present it to our audiences. So I'll introduce Sarah before I go through a little bit more of our tutorial, as hopefully most of our viewers will have joined by then. Sarah Newman is the James Dyke Curator of Contemporary Art at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Her research interests include the relationship between contemporary art and design and art of the 1980s. Newman is the curator of the exhibition Tiffany Chung, Vietnam, Past This Prologue, which opened at the museum on March 15, 2019. And she's also cur currently overseeing a reinstallation of the museum's permanent collection galleries for contemporary art. I'll look forward to checking that out when we can. She organized exhibitions Doho Se, Almost Home in 2018. And of course, the exhibition that we're discussing this evening, Kara Walker, Harper's Pictorial History of the Civil War Annotated in 2017. She also served as, as the guest curator for Feaster Gates, The Minor Arts, which opened March 1st, 2017 at the National Gallery of Art in DC. And she's taught at the Conkren College of Art, Corcoran, excuse me, College of Art and Design, George Mason University and Georgetown University. Newman earned a bachelor's degree from Williams College and her doctorate from the University of California, Berkeley. Thank you for that very nice introduction and thank you all for being with he me here virtually this evening. Um, as Kate mentioned, um, I was originally invited to speak on uh, the occasion of the opening of Kara Walker's Pictorial History of the Civil War Annotated, which was a show that I curated at the Smithsonian American Art Museum two and a half years ago. Um, and I was really, really looking forward to seeing it at Corning. So I'm really um, disappointed not to be able to do this in person, but uh, this is certainly the next best thing. Uh, this is my first Zoom lecture, so this will be a learning curve for, for me as well, so, so, so be generous. Um, and, you know, I really hope that I'm able to, to come to Corning and visit sometime soon. I would love to, love to be there. The museum had been planning an entire year of programming around women artists. Um, it's such an important idea, such, you know, so, so, so exciting, so fun. And I, I know it had a lot of support and interest in the community. Um, and in this spirit, I was intending to talk about Kara Walker's public image and how she uses stereotypes and identity and her identity as um, a black woman um, and the response to her persona to shape her work. But, you know, as Kate mentioned, as in light of the fact that the show um, hasn't yet opened and we're speaking so far away from the works themselves, I thought it would make more sense to turn this talk into more of a preview of the exhibition and the themes that she deals with in this body of work. So now I'm going to try to share my screen. So um, what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about the show itself and to take a closer look at Kara Walker's approach to history in the series of prints that make up Harper's pictorial history of the Civil War annotated from 2005. But um, just to connect what I was talking about before, as it turns out, um, this body of work and Walker's public image are not unrelated. 
Because Walker's approach to history and the shadowy figures that populate her scenes of the reimagined past are wrapped up in how she understands identity. So I'll be talking about this series, but first I wanted to step back and give somewhat of a broader view and think about how she got there. So um, if you could advance. Kara Walker is one of the most prominent artists working today, featured in museum exhibitions and public commissions around the world. But she emerged in the critical and public consciousness in the mid 1990s. Since the very first presentations of her work, Walker's been a bit of a lightning rod for opinion. She's garnered huge numbers of awards. She was the youngest ever person at the time to receive a MacArthur Genius Award at the age of 28 in 1997. But she's also received a not insignificant amount of negative attention. And she became famous um, in the 90s or notorious um, for the type of work that I'm showing here incendiary provocative works that were set in the past, but that were very much about the present. They're ghastly scenes of people doing horrible, but not quite discernible things to each other. Most recognizably, she worked with, worked with the cut paper silhouette, which you're seeing here, um, which was a historically female art popular in the 18th and 19th centuries, and one that was accessible to black women. Walker turned this, what was uh, historically a very small and genteel genre into a medium for monstrous scenes that fester with horrific acts of brutality. And most controversially, she populated them with stereotypical stock figures, including the Confederate soldier, the minstrel, the mammy, and the African savage. If you could advance. When you think about it, it, uh, it makes a lot of sense actually, because these tools that she uses, the silhouette and the stereotype are intimately connected. Walker herself has said that the silhouette says a lot with very little information, but that's also what the stereotype does. And even in their crispness and their black and white clarity, the details of what's going on are quite unclear. With so much left to the imagination, Silhouettes make the audience an equal partner in the horror, demanding that they supply the details and the motivations necessary to interpret them. As a medium, the silhouette is as much about the viewer as it is about the image itself. Walker's room-sized tableau and panorama envelop the viewer and show the dark underbelly of our national nostalgia for the antebellum self. In stark black and white, the scenes are an unvarnished parade of master-slave narratives. They create a nightmarish vision of violence, subjugation, and sexual depravity that can be seen to exist in the shadows of all American history. Slide. The works don't sit easily now, and they didn't then. The disturbing nature of the images themselves, combined with Walker's sudden rise to fame, ignited a firestorm around her of controversy. Somewhat surprisingly, her fiercest and most vocal critics weren't, weren't conservatives who objected to the explicit imagery. So these are not the, the same people who were um, involved in the Robert Maplethorpe NEA scandal from the 80s. Instead, there were fellow artists and often fellow African Americans um, who objected to the offensive stereotypes that, that, that they felt that her work propagated without critique. <clears throat> Betty Saar and Howardina Pindell, both great artists with elder stateswomen status in the art community, led the charge. Saar famous, famously published a letter denouncing Walker, agonizing that she felt a sense of betrayal at the hands of a black artist who obviously hated being black. Both of these artists expressed a profound dismay at what they saw as uh, Walker's playing into uh, white supremacist fantasies. And, and the racism in the white art establishment. Slide. Interestingly, Saar um, had become known earlier in her career for her own work on stereotypes. Um, but you can see here, she used them um, to challenge and to overcome these images. So this is Aunt Jemima holding a broom, but also holding a rifle. And what Saar understood to be um, Walker's reveling in stereotypes seemed to represent a giant step backward. But whatever its merits, the criticism gained traction in part because it gave voice to larger discomfort with Walker's work, um, but which was combined with a distrust of her 
more personal qualities, including her newfound artistic celebrity, as well as the fact that she was married to a white man. Slide. Responding um, to the criticism, Walker stepped into the fray herself, noting that, quote, it's beautiful because to dismiss what I do, it basically does what I do. Creates a stereotype where there once was a person. Uses all of the accoutrements of that person's humanity, their skin, their hair, their social life, to construct another character. The only thing that's missing is, is the signature saying, this is my piece, this is my Kara Walker. I just, I love that. Um, I love that response um, in this, in a very sharp and ironic and brutal way. Walker makes clear that stereotyping isn't some retrograde practice that she's keeping alive, but it's all how we all make sense of the world to some extent. She acknowledges its pervasiveness, its insidious power, and its destructive potential all at once. For Walker, stereotype and caricature are always present. They form the lifeblood and the building blocks of our reality and our history. The danger is in ignoring them so that they do their work without us noticing. The scholar Gwendolyn Dubois Shaw has compellingly argued that Walker's work and her acute attention to stereotypes and her own image can be understood through the concept <clears throat> of double consciousness which was a term developed in the early 20th century by the scholar W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois described the phenomenon co common to African Americans of always looking at yourself through the eyes of others, whether through white society or other African Americans. <clears throat> so in this reality, there's never a neutral state of just existing, or in Walker's case, making work that's not already prejudged. Quote, it's a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels this two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, <clears throat> two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. Slide. Walker came to an understanding of this double consciousness in a very real and a very personal way as a child. When she was 12, she moved with her family um, from Northern California where she'd grown up to a small town outside of Atlanta. And in the South, she suddenly found that her identity as an African American had moved from the background of her life to something that defined her, that carried a fraught history and a weight that she needed to negotiate every day feeling ostracized by both blacks and whites, just as she was trying to navigate life as a teenager, she became an observer of life and of herself. As Dubois Shaw has discussed, Walker began seeing her racial identity as something that was lived and performed on a daily basis in a sort of pageant in which she was an unwilling participant. Walker likened it to a continual reenactment of the Civil War era in the present day. She came to understand the Civil War as an internal conflict, and her art became a search for what her role might be in this unbidden drama. Slide. Which brings us directly to the subject of her work and to the works that are the subject of our exhibition. Harper's Pictorial History of the Civil War Annotated is a series of 15 prints based on the two volume anthology published at the end of the war. To create them, Walker enlarged select illustrations and then overlaid them with stencils of her signature silhouettes. The prints themselves are, are quite large, 39 by 53 inches. Slide. While all of Walker's art is based in meticulous historical research, this was her first direct engagement with the type of material that, her form, that informed her work from the outset. <clears throat> She describes the prints as the landscapes that I imagine exist in the back of my more austere wall pieces. And in the exhibition, we include copies of the original volumes so that you can see her source material and how she alters it, how the images looked on the page and how they're situated amongst other pictures and text. And here you can see um, an example of that in the Harper's image on the left and what Walker has done with it on the right. 
And the scale isn't really comparable here. The original illustration is maybe um, eight inches high and five inches across, while Walker's is about five or six times that size. So the scene is utterly transformed and populated with her shadowy caricatures. And just to give you um, a little more background on the work on the books themselves, um, <clears throat> the lavish two volume anthology that Walker worked with was first printed in 1866 under the title Harper's Pictorial History of the Great Rebellion. <clears throat> it was published by the same house and included much of the same material as Harper's, which was the most widely read weekly magazine of the era. The books commemorated the end of the war and were composed of 836 pages of scenes, maps, plans, portraits, and writings on the conflict and its players. Slide. <clears throat> Although it was commonly understood to be a pro-union publication, the editors were at pains to, to project their neutrality. I thought I'd quote a bit of the preface, which was written in the war's immediate aftermath and gives a good sense of their stated aims. Quote, we have undertaken to write the history of the great conspiracy, which finally culminated in the great rebellion of the United States. We purposed at the outset to narrate events <clears throat> just as they occurred, to speak of living men as impartially as though they were dead, to praise no man unduly because he strove for the right, to malign no man because he strove for the wrong, to anticipate, as far as we might, the sure verdict of art the sure verdict of after ages upon events." End quote. Like the monuments that give definition to the American landscape, the text and its illustrations aim to be an impartial history, an objective commemoration of the glories and the sufferings of the war. Yet as the, as the writer Zadie Smith has noted, if you grow up as Walker did in the shadow of Stone Mountain, George's monumental tribute to the heroes of the Confederacy, you'll have questions. You'll ask, what are we commemorating? Whose history and which memories? Slide. <clears throat> Carol Walker's appropriation of the Harper's engravings suggests the impossibility of any such impartial telling of history. Her silhouettes obliterate some scenes and disrupt others, altering union mo movements as much as Confederate ones and suggesting that the stories she tells have little to do with official events. <clears throat> Her overlaid narrative is as, as, is as if out of a nightmare, happening at the same time, but having little to do with the story battles that share the frame. Perhaps referring back to her own experience as a black person forced to represent a history she felt she had little connection to, Walker here proposes her own version of events. She's always maintained that she's suspicious of this idea that there's only one black, one authentic black story, and there's only one you're allowed to tell. For her, the black experience is not only, not only always plural, it's often messy and perverse. And because it has for so long been misrepresented, she plays with the idea of misrepresenting misrepresentations. Here, a woman wearing a hair wrap and a tattered dress floats ambiguously on the sheet <clears throat> over the scene below and perhaps reacting to it, but not of it. She's rendered in a scale that's several times larger than that of the other figures so that her form interrupts and blacks out part of the original image. The dramatic scene in the background depicts a gathering of Southerners loyal to the Union government, but even in this sympathetic crowd, Walker's figure wants no part of it and she flees even though her legs remain anchored to the ground. And, and as you can see, her foot, um, her back foot points to a young black child crawling and seemingly bereft and lost in the shuffle. Slide. Like that little moment with the boy, um, some works draw attention to details that might get lost in looking at the original. Slide, please. Here, a silhouetted head of a girl appears to land like an alien ship onto the scene, blotting out the events behind it. And it's, it's hard to tell when you're looking at the original, the, the, truly the original is so small, um, the pictures are so tiny that sometimes it's hard to, to see the details. 
but Walker's framing uh, makes him apparent in a different way. So you, you have this silhouetted head that's cut out of the larger silhouette, uh, and it highlights um, this really tender and heroic moment in which a young black boy reaches down to help load a caravan of white civilians uh, evacuating after Confederate losses in Atlanta. Slide. At other times, the works provide surreal alternative storylines, seemingly unanchored from any of the original Harper scenes. For instance, Walker's placed these silhouetted heads over images that in the book face each other, um, but, but the figures that she shows aren't turned towards each other. And then she cuts out, again, she cuts out another silhouette, a silhouette of a man inside the woman's head um, who looks at the other suggesting some secret erotic exchange or hidden relationship, which is activated only when, Har when Walker's prints are placed in the same order and orientation as the originals. Slide. This disturbing figure of a boy with sticks and branches for arms and, <clears throat> for arms and fingers appears in an army train on the left, carrying a bucket and surveying a tragic scene. And he emerges again in negative form in an apparently unrelated picture, packed mules in the mountains, in the mind of what appears to be a white child. Slide. Other figures seem to expand outside the boundaries of the image. In these two prints, mutilated bodies and severed limbs escape from the picture and fly into the margins and the space of real life. Slide. And Cotton Hordes in Southern Swamp evokes a history that you'd never learn about from Harper's and which is still more a part of mythology than any official accounting of the history. The monstrous figure you see emerging from the brackish water um, seems to reference the stories of the Great Dismal Swamp. And the Great Dismal Swamp is a group of bogs in Virginia and North Carolina that became a refuge for escaped slaves, uh, also known as Maroons. And, and these Maroon uh, colonies um, survived and thrived uh, for decades um, and became parallel societies in the swamps. Um, and they also became sites of dread for the white people who, for whom they were legend. Walker's shadows seem to reflect on, react to, and even alter the events that Harper's was attempting to depict just as they occurred a century and a half ago. And her visions of bodies that have been torn up and left behind shows the lie of any pretense of neutrality. <clears throat> Walker's here going toe to toe with official history, replacing one falsehood with another, one form of violence with another. The viciousness and the exaggerations of her images only serve to point up the aggression of her attack on the official version of events. As Zadie Smith has pithily put it, <clears throat> caricature and stereotype are not Walker's flaws, they're her sharpest tools. Walker's aiming to jar the senses, to make you uncomfortably aware of the shifting terrain in which we rest our beliefs. <clears throat> Looked at this way, her works can be seen as an anti-monument or an anti-history, at least of the kind as represented by Harper's. Instead of putting a cap on history as something to be memorialized and appreciated from a distance, she pokes at its wounds and opens up its chasms for all of us to share, to stare into its dreadful unresolvedness. She said that, I don't think my work is actually effectively dealing with history. I think of my work as subsumed by history or consumed by history. Slide. In more recent projects, she continues to rewrite and be consumed by history. In A Subtlety or The Marvelous Sugar Baby from 2014, she turned her attention from its books to its grand memorials, creating a monumental sphinx at the Domino Sugar Factory in Brooklyn that explored the dark legacies of the sugar trade. Slide. <clears throat> and most recently in Fons Americanus, <coughs> in the Tate Modern's Turbine Hall just last year, Walker created a grand fountain to memorialize colonialism's sins and excesses as a counter to the triumphant history represent, commemorated in public squares around London. Her work continues to provoke and stir up ire from younger generations of artists and critics, as well as those who found fault with her in the past. 
And not surprisingly, she's engaged them right back, entering into the fray again and playing along by explicitly not playing along. In the artist statement she put out for a show at her New York gallery a few years ago, she wrote in part, I know what you all expect from me and I've complied up to a point, but frankly, I'm tired, tired of standing up, being counted, tired of having a voice or worse, being a role model. I roll my eyes, fold my arms and wait. And it's really funny in a way because the persona she's putting out into the world is completely at odds with what her art actually does. Walker's work disturbs because of its viciousness, <clears throat> its vitality, its refusal to fold its arms and wait. It writhes and unsettles and gruesomely embodies the messiness of history and how it weighs on us today. It does not go quietly into the night. Retelling the stories of the Civil War seems particularly urgent now when we're thinking as a culture about how to mark this history and the wounds of that period refused to heal. But as much as Walker's work makes us revisit that moment, it also reminds us that all history is alive and contested and the dark shadows lurk everywhere. Thank you. This is a great question, actually from our uh, curator, Kirsty. How does it impact the field of contemporary art when artists speak out to censor other artists' work? Um, and she's citing the controversy that occurred um, at the Whitney Biennale with uh, the open casket painting, with Dana Schutz's uh, open casket painting as an example. And obviously that's something Walker faces regularly. Yes, yeah, um, it's such a good question, it's true. <clears throat> and I don't, I don't know that I have a great answer to it, but yeah, they're, they're um, equivalent. Um, equivalent controversies, I think you're right. Um, and uh, referring to the, the last, <clears throat> the last uh, Whitney Biennale, um, or was it the last? I think, I think, I don't know, time. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> in which the artist Dana Schutz um, painted um, um, the open casket of Emmett Till and a number of, um, people and other artists were angry that she, she, she um, uh, was not properly, um, she was not properly immersed in the material and the emotions of the material and couldn't, couldn't really speak for that material and she didn't really have a, um, a, a right to depict it as she did. Um, and, you know, I, it's so interesting. I mean, I, I can, I can see different sides of this. Um, you know, I, I can completely understand how um, um, people, you know, these images are upsetting <laughs> and they're made to be upsetting. And, um, you know, they're doing their job when they upset people. So that's, a, that's a, 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 something that's showing the, the power of the work. And I don't think that the artists would like to deny that power. And that's part of, you know, that's part of what they create. Um, and certainly Pow uh, Kara Walker acknowledges that. Um, and I think that the debate that happens when, you know, when these images and pictures are put out to the world um, is to a large extent healthy. I think, you know, who, who the questions of who owns an image, who has a right to an image, who, who has a right to a culture, and, and how, how you can um, enter into someone else's culture is, is, is a valid debate. Um, but it does, um, to me, it does um, uh, bleed into different territory when that um, conversation becomes censorship. And when it, um, you know, um, when people are calling for work to be taken off view. I mean, I think, mm -hmm something that's that's so um so needling about carol walker so so vital about carol walker is that her work is not a safe space you know <laughs> she's not um she's not she's not saying that you know you're not going to be offended she's not saying that you, you know basically the works are going to trigger you the works will, will upset you and that's what they're trying to do and she's trying to evoke these these really ugly emotions so, um, you know, denying that power and shutting that down um, 
to me, to me crosses a line. I think, you know, I think we need that. I think we need to have these conversations. That's a great take on it, um, right? In terms of the question about how does it affect the world of contemporary art, the conversation moves the, the world forward, whereas the censorship kind of, you know, you don't get that opportunity to discuss it. And if we can't discuss it, then, you know, then where are we? We're just back where we began. Um, and right, it was the, the Biennale before last, I remember that, <laughs> um, yeah. but um, right, the, yeah, that one really did go into the, the grounds of censorship with people wanting to take it off view and destroy the work and um, the, the kind of threats made against the Whitney for it. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's an important distinction to make between the, the conversation about work that doesn't try to be safe and the censorship. So, thank you. Okay, we've got plenty of questions rolling in here. Can you speak more about how Kara Walker effectively uses humor to draw in the viewer and help diffuse some of the difficulty of the subject matter? That's a very interesting question. I don't know. Um, yeah, it is, it is a good question. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that all responses to this work are valid. Um, I think that some of them, you know, bleed into caricature so much that they are kind of, they are kind of funny, you know, um, and she's, they're grotesque, they're violent, they're horrific, but they're so extreme that they, you kind of have to laugh a little bit. So they, it's like, you just, you're just so unsettled. Um, right. So I think that's right. part of it. They're just keeping you off balance. You don't know how to think. Um, I think, you know, recently she's been, um, in her, in her more recent works, um, in the last couple of years, she's been doing something a little bit different than she has in in the past. And she's uh, the works aren't set in the past. They're not set in the antebellum South the way most of her work has been. They're set in the present day. They kind of mix timelines, but they use figures from today in a recognizable way. So she has a series, uh, or she has some works that use uh, the image of President Trump, and then her latest series uses Obama in different situations and they're um, you know they're they're terrifying but they're also kind of they're also kind of funny because they're these they're just they're satire in this strange way where you don't really know what they're saying but I think that you know she's using all these tools to just keep you off balance I think that's really the, the goal mm -hmm. So um, we have a question about speaking to um, the sentiment of Walker's personal sentiment of the Civil War being internal. Um, and it seems like that was a contemporary expression of the devil consciousness, the battle between oneself as African American and how others see you as African American, um, and whether that dichotomy became more pronounced in the family's move to the South, which I think is what you spoke to. Um, when talking about that. So the question is a little bit more about Walker's kind of personal sentiment and how um, that shift happened for her to be experiencing that double consciousness. Yeah, I mean, she's talked about that explicitly that, you know, when she was growing up um, in California, she just, she didn't think about being black in a particular way. She was just a person. Um, and then when she moved to, to the South, it became, you know, it was, it was the defining aspect of her identity for so many people. So she had to think of herself as black in a, in a very different way. And she had this relationship to her race and to, you know, to the Civil War, which she hadn't put much thought into. But, you know, the Civil War had happened there and she was this kind of unwitting player in it and this un, unwitting um, and unwilling recipient of its legacies. So I think, you know, it just became something that was thrust on her and she just, you know, her life, I, I think for a long time, she was trying to just to reconcile with that. She didn't do that explicitly um, for a long time. Um, you know, she went to art school and she wasn't making explicit work. She wasn't making work about race mm -hmm. um, uh, and her, I think her professors were urging her to do that. And she, you know, being the contrarian she is, she just said, <laughs> yeah, that's not my interest. Uh, but then she kind of, 
you know, it was bubbling up the whole time and, you know, she, um, she eventually kind of came around to it and, and mm -hmm. had an outlet for it. Right. Very interesting. Um, the next question is one, like we said, you know, kind of, it's very, very relevant today. And um, this kind of relates to this idea of her grappling with this. And that's, um, how does this particular set of, of works by Sarah Walker, this suite of prints in particular, help contextualize what we see happening in American culture today? I mean, I think, to me, the big takeaway from, from this work and from so much of her work is that um, it's just unresolved, <laughs> you know, that, you know, and, and, and I think that she was very explicit about that and this work is very explicit about that in a way that we can um, recognize now is true. I think maybe 10 years ago when, you know, we had the first black president and, you know, everybody was kind of, maybe I think there was more of a papering over of the wounds um, uh, in a way that people were thinking that maybe, you know, we'd healed from this, this vicious past. And it's become clearer and clearer that we haven't. We haven't moved past it and, and the wounds are still raw. This history is still, um, you know, it's still present in so many ways. It's present in our psychology. It's present in, in how people live. It's, you know, and it's present in how uh, people have access to healthcare. It's just, it's ordered our society in a way that um, is not, um, it's not something that we can, that we can put away. So, so to me, that's what these works just remind us of all the time, that this history is, is with us. Um, right. And I also, I mean, to me, what's sort of so interesting about them is that, you know, I, I was putting this show together um, at the time when there were, it was, we were thinking so much about, it was, we're having the controversy about um, memorials to the Civil War. Right. The war generals. So it was really in, in people's minds. Um, and you know, everybody, everybody, it's like, you know where you stand on that issue. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. Like so many people, you know, there's, just like in everything today, people know what they think. There's this side, there's this side, there's very little in between. And, you know, we kind of, we, we choose a side. And then to me, when you're looking at these works, it's like, there's no side, you know, right. <laughs> there's, there's, it's just all a mess. It's like, all the people are horrible. It's not like black people are good and white people are bad or like, it's not like people are victims or not. It's everybody is mm -hmm. doing terrible things. Everybody's being brutalized. Everybody is, you know, it's just a world that's this parallel universe and it kind of like, it's, it's, you know, it's true surrealism and it just takes you to a place where it's not, it's not, um, it's, it's not either or. It's mm -hmm. like this whole different thing. Mm. Right. And remind us, you put the show together in 2017, but what year um, were these works created? 2005. Right. So like you said, kind of at that point in time, America was kind of feeling like we could move past it move yeah. past things right exactly so just makes it all the more uh relevant certainly um great thank you do you know here's a question if um i'm sorry if i'm pronouncing her name wrong but <laughs> betty Sar uh has changed her view of kara walker over the years or is she still a critic of hers i think she's still a critic um She's she's definitely still great. I think at some point she stopped wanting to talk about it so much. <laughs> um, uh -huh. it, it became like the defining thing about her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, sure. The people were asking her more about Kara Walker than they were about her own work. And I, I think that, you know, just became distracting. So I, I don't think she's as active a critic, but, I, you know, I, I think the works still don't sit well. Yeah. Sure. Which, as we said, is that's kind of the point. Um, and let's see, I'm uh, definitely open to taking in a couple more questions. This is the last one I have for now. Um, nope, I have some more, okay. <laughs> um, but you started to kind of touch on this when we talked about contextualizing our present day events. Um, I think this is a really, really interesting question. So this artwork 
you know, is a fiction. This is the way the question's worded, but it's based on kind of nonfiction. Like fiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's based on, on non, what we would think of as nonfiction. So um, the question is, how does exposing people to fiction help educate them about nonfiction? Well, I think that her, uh, Kara Walker's response, or I think that the works, that the, resp the response that the works uh, would give is um, that it's all a fiction, <laughs> you know? Um, you know, basically exactly. she's saying that you think this is nonfiction, you think this is what happened, but look at what it's leaving out. Look at, you know, look, look what it's not talking about. Look what it's, you know, there, there's so much you don't know um, and it's all in the details and it's all in the, these kind of the, these dark stories that are just, you know, uh, not even on the margins. They're just not talked about. Right. Um, so you have little, you know, little stories of, of, you know, you have black, some black soldiers, you have some black people, um, you have this black boy down here who's, who's lost and you have some black heroes, but it's not, this is not the black experience of the civil war. And this is not the experience of the Civil War. So I think she's saying that, you know, it's all, it's, it's all fiction. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I think we're grateful to artists like her. And I, I think of her like kind of as a, like almost a twin with Titus Kaphar as well. Their work is pretty similar, exposing us to that historical subject matter and pointing out um, where it's lacking. So, um, we're glad that we have them here to do that for us. Um, okay, I've got a couple more here. Um, we're getting, we've got about 10 more minutes, so um, we could probably take another, another couple of questions before we run out of time. Walker opened her personal archive of drawings for exhibition this year. Have those more um, gestural, kind of spontaneous, maybe unfinished pieces that she opened for exhibition uh, recently influenced her um, your interpretation of her other work that's a good question um, I didn't unfortunately see that show in person I would have really liked to um, um, but yeah I mean I'd known about some of that work um, and I've seen some of it, um, but yeah, that was the most kind of extensive presentation of, of these drawings that are much more, um, much more personal. As I said, a lot of them take place in the present or use present day figures in the works, but they're, um, they're very expressive. So they're not, you know, these crisp um, silhouettes like we're used to seeing of her. And I just think that it does, um, you know, show the, the anguish that is in these in these images and, and shows the, um, the you know the deep kind of personal investment that she has in them and, and they're 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 personally worked and she's she's not um, this is not clinical in any way mm -hmm. right right yeah it's an interesting contrast especially when we get so accustomed to seeing one side of an artist <clears throat> that are known for one thing great questions. Um, this is a really interesting uh, kind of observation that somebody has here with us. It's a contrast, it's such a contrast to see the visuals, the color palette that she chooses to use between the silhouettes and then the sculptures. With her silhouettes, she's primarily using black and with the sculptures, she's primarily using white. Um, and the question is like whether that's purposeful um, did she consider using color for the sculptural work or um, intending to replicate the familiar materials of, of sculpture, which is usually marble? Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's more of it. I mean, there were, um, when you, I don't think I have an image of it, but with um, this work, a subtlety, there are, there were a lot of works around it. Um, part of it that were made of bronze also. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't just this. Um, well, first of all, this, I have to say, is made out of sugar. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> so right. So it's, it's literally um, about, you know, it's about sugar. Um, and it's right. made of sugar. So it has this, this monumental quality where it looks like a, you know, a grand um, marble sculpture. Uh, it has that quality, but it is uh, you know, powdery. Um, and there are other sculptures around it that are made of bronze. 
Oh, I didn't know that. Um, but the the recent work at the um, at the Tate, which is this um, operational fountain, um, is you know meant meant to be on the same scale and look just like a, one of the fountains outside. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right. I think her color choices really replicate the materials that she's appropriating. And um, our next question is is. Rel relevant to this, which is um, what reading is added to the work um, by her appropriation of the Victorian paper silhouette tradition. So if you could speak a little bit more about the, the Victorian silhouette tradition, how that impacts the reading of her work. Yeah, I mean, it's such an interesting, you know, such an interesting um, genre or medium. Um, it was, you know, when you see Victorian silhouettes, they're very small. Um, they are uh, kind of domestic um, in scale. They were done by, usually by women who, um, uh, you know, made them by hand and then they were put into people's houses. So they had this very kind of feminine quality and very safe, very, very genteel quality. So, you know, transforming these, um, this, this medium into something that's just about horror and, um, you know, pain and death and destruction um, is, you know, is really turning it on its head. And again, you know, kind of showing, showing that, you know, even things you think are safe are just, um, you know, are not, nothing is safe. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also, I mean, there's also um, a different, they were, they were used domestically, but they were also used um, um, as kind of um, studies in physiognomy at the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when she talks about the silhouette and the stereotype as being kind of intertwined, which mm -hmm. they are, um, you know, they were originally, that was part of their purpose. They would, people um, use them for kind of case studies, for physiognomic case studies of, of different types of people, of criminals, of, you know, people who were, um, uh, you know, had certain attributes. So they would have, you know, a whole kind of lineup of these silhouettes and showing, you know, this, this nose means this and this head mm -hmm. means this. Um, so they were, you know, from the very beginning, these, these, these silhouettes were used as a kind of vehicle for, for stereotyping. Wow, that's fascinating. I would not have ever known that. Wow. Well, um, if there are any final questions, um, we do have time probably for one more, but um, if not, I think ending on, you know, the idea that nothing is, is safe is a great place to stop. <laughs> um, thank you again so much. We have a lot of uh, thank yous in the chat and just, you know, excellent presentation. I, you know, pick some out and share them with you so you can see all of your, all your, your fans. Um, but really, I mean, what a great opportunity for us you know, for the Rockwell Museum, for anybody who might have tuned in who um, might be a little bit farther afield and wouldn't be able to come in person. We're just really, you know, honored for this opportunity to have you speak and we look forward to being able to see this exhibit with, with new eyes when we can finally see it this summer. So thank you. Thank you so much. This was really fun.